right, well, I hope you all had a lovely uh, lunch. So um, we're gonna kick off the afternoon sessions with a panel of um, individuals who earn their PhDs from comparative human development or human development as the case may be. Um, I'm Anna Muller. I'm the newest addition to the faculty in comparative human development. And um, I've sometimes been told that I'm supposed to replace Richard Tao, but I don't think that's, uh, <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> but I am um, very pleased that Richard helped uh, recruit me and I am uh, happy to continue the tradition of sociology playing a role in uh, comparative human development. Um, so I'm going to very uh, briefly introduce our panel since there's so many of them. I'm gonna hold my introductions to a, a you know, I could spend 10 minutes introducing each of these amazing and impressive scholars. So <clears throat> the second person here is uh, Nancy Segal, who graduated um, from Comparative Human Development in 1982, and she's uh, now a professor of developmental psychology. Uh, next to her is Linda Fitzgerald, who uh, graduated in 1990, and she's a professor of early childhood education at the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, next to her is Lena Jensen, who's Comparative Human Development 1996, and she's an Associate Professor of Psychology at Clark University. Next is Lawrence Giannino, who uh, graduated in 1999, and he's a Research Professor at Tufts University in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development. And next is Amy Cooper, who's Assistant Professor of Anthropology at St. Louis University. And then um, Les Beldo, uh, who's Comparative Human Development, uh, class of uh, 2014, and he's a visiting fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And then finally, Mike Kaufman, who's hard to find online, but he graduated in 2014. And uh, luckily, since I overlap with him at the demography workshop, I knew how to find out that he is a postdoc at the Center for Aging across the Midway. Um, so without any <laughs> further ado, I'm gonna um, let Nancy take us off well, ever since Rick asked me to be part of this panel, I've had a flood of memories from this time and this place. Some of them seemed as vivid as the time I experienced them, and I was remembering things that I had totally forgotten for years and years. I was a student in human development in the fall of 1975 until the summer of 1982, when it was just a committee. And my first memory is before I was even formally admitted. I wanted to do a twin study on cooperation and competition in evolutionary perspective, and I approached Dan Friedman with the idea, and his comment was to me, well, you're a rare bird on this campus. Because if you remember, at that time in the mid-70s, genetic influences on behavior were not popular, and anyone who got into that area took a rather great academic risk. But Dan wasn't afraid of these kinds of things. He relished controversy, he didn't shy from it. And um, anyway, that was one of the things I found so refreshing about Dan. And I was able to put together a really fine committee, I felt. Daryl Bach from Methodology and Jerry Levy from Biopsych. Outside reader was Elizabeth Doris, a research scientist in psychiatry, and Michael Wade over in biology. And that was something that I so appreciated about this campus and about this department, was that if you had a reasonable idea, there were talented faculty around you who you could find to support you. And I also remember that um, when I worked with the three of them, with, with Dan and Daryl and Jerry, one issue I had was that the three of them really liked and respected each other a lot. And so I would get these three sets of comments on my dissertation, I would feel so overwhelmed. So I eventually learned that I had to treat Dan with a certain status and the other two a little bit lower, and then I was able to cope with things. And I, I also remember that I was the first generation of people to type their dissertation on the mainframe. And so what that did was it generated this green and white fanfold paper. And so I remember the first time I went into Dan and said, this is my chapter. And, and he and the others just looked so befuddled. Like, what is this? You know? But it was, it was really great. Anyway, um, I recall student days when everything seemed possible and days when nothing seemed possible. Some of the great days were when I would return from testing my twins and I would meet with Dan and we'd talk about the observations and what they meant, and I just loved that. And another great time was the weekly evolutionary psychology reading groups that Dan did. And uh, some of the members are here today, uh, Rich Williams and, and Carolyn Glenn Weisfeld, and we know there are two or three others, but we can't remember who they were. <laughs> um, Dan also gave me great advice on two occasions. 
And um, what happened was after my first year in human development, when I completed most of my coursework, I got a fellowship to study at the Hebrew University in Israel. So I abandoned my twin idea for the moment, and I gathered data on Israeli gifted children. I came back with the data, thinking that I would use it for dissertation, and I found myself fighting it. It didn't make my heart sing. It just wasn't working. I didn't like the data, and I didn't like reading about it. So I was very worried about it, and I went to Dan, and I said, what should I do? And Dan gave me the best bit of advice I ever had on this campus. He said, fuck the gifted children. <laughs> And I walked out of his office, my heart was singing again, and I was, I was right back on track. And when I, left, when I left the University of Chicago, Dan said to me, follow your bliss. And I've always done that, and I've always tried to pass it on to my students, because you've got to love it. But there were difficult days as well. Dan could be trying sometimes. I took the individual style prelim. I don't know if you still have that today, but it's when students generate their own questions and their own reading list. And then on the appointed day, you come into the office and get your questions, and you have a week to answer it. So I show up at Human Development on a Monday morning at 9. There's no Dan. So after a few minutes, Betty Coelty gave him a call at home. He totally forgot. He's coming right in, he said. So an hour later, he came in to find me, rolled into this anxious little ball on the stairs of Human Development. He patted me on the shoulder, went upstairs, and brought down my questions. And um, this also reminds me that at that time when I was studying for prelims, that Dan did me a great favor that I've kept secret for, for about 34 years, but I'm going to tell you all about it now because it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> the library was undergoing renovations at the time, and it was really loud and noisy. So Dan got me a faculty study in his name and gave me the key. And I used to go back to those little maze ways, and there were other faculty back there in other departments and they'd try to be friendly, who are you? And I, I was just horrible. I didn't talk to anybody because I didn't want this secret to be discovered. Um, another trying time was when I passed my proposal and for some reason, Daryl, Dan, and Jerry left the campus for conferences or travel or something like that. So I heard about an NSF dissertation fellowship and I thought I would apply for it. And Mike Csikszentmihalyi, who was the chair at the time, had to sign off on it. So he did, and he said to me, you'll never get it. And I thought, well, you know, that's not quite right to say, but let's see what happens. A few months went by, I got the fellowship. That was the same day that Human Development was hosting a barbecue, and I ran over there with my letter, showed it to Mike, and Mike goes, this is great for our department. And I thought, <laughs> I think it's great for me. But, <laughs> but, but now that I understand academics a little bit more, I understand that these kinds of student achievements reflect well on departments and on chairs, so I'm, I'm a little more forgiving. <laughs> and um, I also remember that I was not very savvy when it came to grants, and the NSF officer said to me, you need to hand in a revised budget. Well, I didn't know what a revised budget was. I thought that you just add to it because you now know what your real expenses are. <laughs> so I added $1,000 to it and got it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the last... The last memory I want to share is that it was the day that I handed my thesis into the reader, and I went down those three flights of stairs to the subterranean palace where Plankton, or Plan we used to call him Plankton, where, where he lived. <laughs> and uh, I came up, and it was, it was something like June or July, and I realized I had nothing to do anymore. And it, it, was, not, it was not the joyous, gleeful, wild moment I expected, but kind of this, this inner emptiness, and I thought, you know, my whole purpose in being here at the University of Chicago is no longer. And I had a postdoc in hand, so I knew that the immediate future was taken care of. But I suddenly realized that I'm leaving this familiar place and this, this department and my friends. And this is what really defined me, I think, as an academic. Life was very intense in those days, especially the days when everything was possible. And that's what I think truly defines you. So Rick also asked us to comment briefly on some areas of our own fields now that are important and timely. And I know my time is up, but I'm going to mention two really quickly. Uh, I'm doing a study right now, the, the first perspective study ever done on Chinese twins who have been separately adopted into different families in the US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, they've been separated indirectly uh, due to the one-child policy. So I'm tracking these kids over time. 
And the other area I would say is that in twin research generally, twins who are discordant for various conditions, autism, schizophrenia, are of great interest now in terms of identifying the epigenetic mechanisms that might underlie those differences. So let me just say how proud I am to have been a part of this department and to be asked to join this special panel. Thank you. Well, I'm Linda Fitzgerald, and I'm a professor of early childhood education at the University of Northern Iowa, the old Iowa State Teachers College. And um, I, I wrote my seven minutes, I hope, um, because I'm used to teaching a five and a quarter hour class from about one page of notes, or not quite one page of notes. So I, I can go on forever. So I'm just going to I hate reading, and I hate people who read, but I'm going to do it. Um, so again, uh, Rick and committee, I'm, I'm just so honored that I was asked to be uh, on this alumna panel. And uh, then when I thought about it, I thought, well, who else has been here for 20 years, you know, really involved? Um, I, I, they were putting us in order of graduation, but it's not the order of graduation, it's when did you start? Um, and I started in 1970 when I was a senior in the new collegiate division in tutorial studies. So I'm totally undisciplined from the very beginning. Um, and I was searching around for somebody to work with who knew anything about kids and child development. I had been working in, um, with some faculty members in the Committee of Ideas and Methods. And the Committee on Social Thought was sort of thought of as the graduate version of the new collegiate division. Uh, we were just completely undisciplined in those days. And um, nobody there really, I was reading Piaget, but I was reading it with a philosopher and a theoretical biologist who was working on uh, robots. And I was, <laughs> and I was reading uh, Immanuel Kant. And um, I finally decided I'd had enough of philosophy and I wanted to get back to real kids. And so, they sent me to Starkey Duncan, who was totally clueless. And, um, but he suggested that there was this Gus Blasi who seemed to teach something about kids. So I started working with Gus Blasi on my bachelor's paper and then just moved right into my master's. And before I finished my master's, he was fired. So then um, I had my chicks at Mihai was great at picking up orphans and he picked me up. <laughs> and I learned all kinds of things about writing that I use now to teach my own students and my doctoral students, and I always credit him with that. Um, then I went off to India because I thought I was gonna do a dissertation on child rearing in India, and um, I'd pick up the language first. I'd gotten A's in all five languages that I'd ever taken classes in, and I am unintelligible to a native speaker in any of them. And because <laughs> at the UFC, you know, they don't teach you practical skills. They teach you how to read, right? And um, so I came back and I said, well, I'll do a quick and dirty American thesis and then I'll have my doctorate and I'll go back over on a postdoc and I'll hire some interpreters and then I'll do my study. So in 1990, I finished my quick and dirty study. Um, <clears throat> and I was written up on the second page of the Sunday Sun Times. Uh, as one of the people who finally finished at the University of Chicago. So that was kind of my 15 minutes of fame, I guess. Um, I'm amazed at how many of my favorite University of Chicago professors have been here. Um, but a conspicuous one who's missing is my dissertation advisor, Alison Clark Stewart. And when she died a very untimely death two springs ago, um, Sabe Manali started asking around about how we could do a memorial at the University of Chicago for the time that she was here. <clears throat> and she had left so long ago, hardly anybody in any position of power knew of her, and we couldn't, you know, get Rockefeller Chapel or anything. So we kind of kept looking for, is there a conference that we could do a memorial at or, you know, whatever. So Saba and Suzanne Gaskins and Enora Brown and I uh, just kept brainstorming and trying to figure out what to do. So when I got this invitation, it was like, oh great, I can finally do my memorial to Allison. So here goes. Um, in the memory of the great generosity with which she launched two of my careers, 
uh, I want to give tribute to Alison Clark Stewart, her generosity of spirit and of good times and a, even of clothing. Um, when I came back from India in 1975, um, Rick Schwader had been hired and uh, he had some data from Marissa, I think, that he needed to have coded and I was looking for a job and so they connected me up with Rick and then he was my advisor for a few years. I think I went through about everybody in human development as an advisor at one time or another. And um, that didn't take very long and when we were through doing that, he suggested that I go see Allison Clark Stewart who had just gotten a big grant and she needed a project director. So she hired me as an assistant project director. And um, we did a very ambitious Chicago study of child care and development for the next three years. In 1978, we finished the data collection. Um, and then I went off to Tennessee for a few years. She went to California. We were kind of going back and forth in and out of Chicago. Each of us had a kid. Um, and, you know, we'd kind of connect back up every once in a while. She wouldn't let me finish a dissertation with anything less than all the subjects and all the variables. <laughs> and she said, we'll get a book out of it. Well, we did get a book out of it, and it probably did get me a job. But it actually took 15 years to collect and analyze all of that data with us going back and forth you know, between the coasts and raising our kids and all that kind of thing. Um, so when the money ran out, um, I needed a job. And she offered me some of her clothes to go down to the Spencer Foundation <laughs> and do an interview as a program officer. And that started a 10-year career uh, as uh, a foundation person. And, um, and I kept analyzing data and kept meeting with her. And finally, we finished the study. I graduated in 1990 and that ended my 20-year career <laughs> at the University of Chicago in human development. So that's my tribute to Allison. I've carried it on. I've become an educationist. That is my discipline. Education <laughs> is a discipline <clears throat> with its own methods and its own theory, and it's never been accepted in that way at the University of Chicago, and I feel kind of proud for being sort of anti-iconoclastic in that way as well. Thank you. All right, so I'm Lena Jensen, and I would just like to start out by saying how delighted I am to be back in what I consider to be my intellectual home, and to see many familiar faces as well as new ones. Uh, I was a student in HD from 1989 to 1996, and some of that time I spent in the house on Woodlawn Avenue, some of it I spent in Bhubaneswar, India, and some of it I spent immersed in evangelical and mainline Baptist churches in Columbia, Missouri. So all in all, those were probably years uh, of what is sort of a quintessential HD experience and education, except now HD has moved. But um, so. I thought what I'd like to do sort of with seven minutes or so is to extract uh, a few lessons that I've learned through HD. And so the first one is that accidents can be lucky. Uh, when I applied to graduate school, I did not apply to HD. I applied to the Department of Psychology, thinking that I would like to do cognitive psychology. And at the time, I had a sort of European idea of what cognitive psychology was, and that was actually very far from what the American cognitive psychology looked like at the time. So one day, I received a phone call from Gil Hurt, who explained to me that my application had been forwarded over, and that he did not think that I really wanted psychology. Um, <laughs> So we talked and we talked and finally Gil asked, well, do you know anyone in HD or at the UFC? And I said, well, I've read some of the work of Richard Schwader. And he's, so that was that. At that point in time, we agreed I'd come to HD and indeed I did. And so I'm a sort of accidental but fortunate HD student. 
Um, so that brings me kind of to the second lesson that I took from HD, and that one has been revolutionary to my scholarship and I think more broadly as well. So what I just described as an accident, someone else might describe that in an entirely different way. So for example, they might describe it as karma. Um, and so the point is that I think HD is like no other place in teaching one to think culturally, to really see human development through a cultural lens. Um, for example, in early conversations with Rick about how to analyze my trial research interviews, which I'd conducted with adults about their personal moral experiences, he introduced me to the three ethics. And at that time, that was really fresh and exciting to me because moral development, the literature at that point in time, at least in my view, was sort of somewhat locked into a small set of uh, one-size-fits-all frameworks. And so to me, this was exciting. And I think precisely because it was so unorthodox, that's why over time and up till this day, I've continued to use uh, that framework in some of the work that I do. Uh, also, many of the courses that I took in HD were essentially guided participation toward a cultural perspective. And so I took wonderful and challenging courses with Gil Hurt, whose uh, ethnographic work I actually just used in a class that I taught. Peggy Miller, again, I actually just used her work. Uh, Dan Friedman, Jim Stigler, uh, Mike Shiksen-Mihail, David Orlinsky, uh, Bert Kohler, and also Don Browning, who was in the Divinity School at the time. So, of course, as you can tell from these names, HD was diverse in those days, too. Uh, not every course was a cultural voyage. Uh, many were a journey kind of across time. And so I would say that's the third lesson that I took from HD, is the focus that HD has had for a long time on the entire life course, not just childhood. Uh, as I mentioned, I think the cultural approach has been revolutionary in the field of psychology, uh, where I think it'd be fair to say that, oh, I don't know, about 90% of publications are by Americans, uh, with Americans, and for Americans. But the interesting thing is that the life course perspective remains remarkably avant-garde as well. Uh, while 90% of publications are not by infants and for infants, they are with infants and very young children. And so uh, maybe one day life course research in developmental psychology will no longer be off time to cite Bernice Newgarden. Um, I think in my own scholarship, subsequent to HD, I found it really compelling or I found it interesting to try to synthesize that cultural perspective with the life course perspective. And so that's something that I term a cultural developmental approach to psychology. So HD is about ideas, HD is also about the people. And so I think as I come toward the end here, um, I would like to just say a little bit about some of the various persons, uh, fellow students as well as faculty, whom I found very supportive in my years here. And so, for example, three to four months after moving here, my car was stolen. And um, at the time, Lisa from my cohort, she essentially said, no, you are not to go down to the city pound on your own in order to try to retrieve your car. She was local and she knew about the city pound. By the way, Jim, they also wanted cash. <laughs> uh, three to four years into my studies, I went to live with Usha Menon and her family in Bhuvaneshwar, India in, to, in order to work on my um, dissertation research. And I think it's fair to say that never have I been embraced so um, wholeheartedly by a new family. And never have I eaten so well either, by the way. Um, and then before coming here, yesterday I sort of dug out my dissertation uh, in order to see exactly what I'd had to say about Rick in there, um, because Rick has been ever accommodating. And so here's what I wrote in the acknowledgments, quote, Special thanks are due to my advisor, Richard Schwader, 
always encouraging and supportive of my expeditions to new places in the world and new places in the mind. I appreciate his generosity, reliability, and intellectual incisiveness, unquote. And so certainly those words are just as true today as they were, amazingly enough, 20 years ago. Um, I do want to mention that one other person who was on my dissertation was Bill Goldstein. Uh, Bill and I had started to meet when I did my trial research in order to confer about statistics, and then we just sort of kept meeting. And Bill really forced me to think about the logic of what I was doing. Why was I doing it that way? Why were I using those methods? Why would I want to analyze it that way? And so even by my seventh year, Bill still wanted to make my dissertation better and better and better until finally I sort of said, uh, <laughs> because it's one thing to be an accidental student, but I want to make sure I'm not, I was not a sort of eternal student. <laughs> So, I'm going to wrap up, I promise. Uh, since my accidental days at HD, I have found it really meaningful to try to be engaged with students who've come after me, such as Phil Hammack and Lara Perez Faulkner, Allison DiBianca Fasoli, I saw her just earlier, uh, Jacob Pickman, and Seamus Power. And I think what I've learned, if I'm to sort of take all my extractions and distill them into one <coughs> pithy, take-home message, as Rick always wanted me to get to. What's the take-home message? The take-home message, I think, is that HD is a community that continues after HD. And so, indeed, I think an event like this one is a special opportunity to bridge the past and the future. And so, for that, I thank Margaret and Rick and the organizing committee and everyone who's been involved in organizing this event. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Janino. I feel very honored to be up here with all of you and among you, um, but I feel like I'm an outlier in this group here. And um, competing for a uh, record that I had no intention of ever trying to, to make, um, I began here with John in 1972, and I received my PhD in 1999. And uh, what I'm up here for is to tell you a little bit my narrative uh, of what happened. If I can. <laughs> um, like most of you here today, I arrived at the University of Chicago in human development aspiring and expecting to teach and conduct research at the university level once I received my doctorate. In fact, at that time, both my wife Susan and I never considered anything else when it came to our careers. However, the unexpected happened, and for family reasons, I had to drop plans that I was developing for my dissertation research, which focused on children's understanding of the economic world and taking place in a remote area of the world. And to support my family, I had to embark on an entirely new and different career path than the one I had, that I had envisioned taking. But I was fortunate. I was soon offered and accepted a position that put me in a wonderful non-academic program. Now, but I had to mentally prepare myself for that change. I told myself that I was about to begin field work in a remote new lands of a different kind than the <laughs> one I originally intended. and would need to use all of my training uh, in human development as the intellectual north star in adapting and learning during my new journey. It worked. With the, with human development and its faculty, in particular on my dissertation, Rick, Mike Chicks Chicksett-Mahai, and Tom Trubasso, I found that you can make a difference. You can innovate. You can live a life of consequence. You can impact innumerable lives in the business world. In my case, in advertising, and then in the uh, television and media world, and also in the foundation world. I learned that Work in these worlds is always results-oriented, impact-focused, and feedback is instantaneous by academic standards, <laughs> and signaled in so many different ways. And as it turned out, I thrived. Let me just give you a little bit of sense of the kinds of activities that I was involved in during this time. 
um, because there's a, a very large, certainly, a social uh, science uh, component to all of this. But again, it was underlined and uh, supported by the training that, that I had in human development. In advertising, like in any field of work, you have to pay your dues. And I did that in Chicago and then took increasingly responsible leadership positions in uh, advertising agencies in New York. My clients included many blue chip client companies, which gave me the opportunity to work with and learn from some really smart, good, and caring people whose expertise was outside fields of research. And perhaps as a result of that, too, there was a great deal of work that I did that had an applied character to it. And that's something perhaps if people are interested in another time, this visit or another time, we could have a large discussion just on the whole issue of uh, theory, research, and practice and links to that. Um, I was involved in the creation and evaluation of both consumer advertising and business-to-business -business advertising, two very different categories of research. My dissertation topic on economic socialization had a lot to do with my getting into the advertising world. We dealt with issues concerning the topic on a daily basis. So for example, as a key part of how we develop communication strategies in advertising, we regularly study the nature of economic exchange transactions involving adults, teens, or child consumers within the context of specific product and service categories, in particular usage contexts. And we consider it as critical to our work an understanding of the role of values, attitudes, and affect or emotion in economic decision making, along with so-called rational components of decision making. And this was well before the time that economists integrated animal spirits into their modus operandi. I also worked with a large number of our agency's international units in Japan and in Western Europe regarding consumer profiles, product use and trends, and national attitudes, values, and lifestyles. My work in advertising and leadership skills got the attention of the brass at ABC Television Network. I have to say that I was like a kid in a candy store. A couple of us have been in candy stores, I guess, lately. <laughs> Uh, when they recruited and hired me, and I took charge of a primary or custom <coughs> research for all network programming for the network. That included everything in the morning from, say, Good Morning America um, to Ted Koppel at that particular time, and all the primetime programming, soaps, and so forth. To put things into perspective uh, for you, at that time, the annual research budget for the ABC network, encompassing all areas of research, including mine, was $25 million. That was a scale of indicative of how important research is to the successful operation of a television network. My major priority was my teams and I working closely with programmers and producers in New York and Los Angeles on all programs, scripts, characters, character development, first impressions, program evaluation, diagnostics, that sort of thing. My international work was intermittent, involved assessments. Uh, of the research-related capabilities of foreign media companies that ABC Disney was considering for possible acquisition and development of a familiarity and understanding of how media was regarded and fit into the lives of individuals in those countries. Um, after I worked at the ABC television network, I did take a wonderful opportunity to work at the William T. Grant Foundation in New York City. Foundation, as many of you may know, is a, it funds social science research that focuses on young people 5 to 25 years of age. I was in charge of strategic communication at the foundation and developed and directed its communication strategy targeting networks of influential scholars, policymakers, and practitioners. I used my extensive research that I had uh, accumulated up to that point uh, in applying <coughs> research to real impact. And that time, what I became familiar with, I was telling Rick about this earlier, was the demand that young scholars in our faculty scholars program would convey to me in terms of they wanted to have an imp their, they wanted their research to have an impact on the world. But they were stymied by the infrastructure of the academy in terms of not allowing or not providing a criteria that would allow their work in trying to have real world impact count for tenure. Um, the uh, special benefits that accrued the foundation were many. How am I doing on time? Please. Okay. Pardon me. The uh, special benefits that I accrued at the foundation were many. It included <coughs> the opportunity to become familiar with the knowledgeable about 
cutting edge research in many areas covered by our foundation, to establish a network of top university scholars here in the United States and abroad, and to reconnect to my own academic roots. As I just mentioned, it was while I was working at the foundation world that I firmly reconnected with university scholars and researchers. And long story short, that, that, that access eventually resulted in me being offered and taken an academic position at Tufts University, where I've been over the course of the past 10 years. So it took me a while, okay, <laughs> but, uh, and I had a wonderful experience between the time I had to leave the university um, to the time I finished my dissertation, and I've got to say it's been a grand trip. I hope <laughs> to continue. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to thank the people who organized this conference or this, this anniversary celebration um, for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, it's an honor to represent fellow PhD alums from my generation and reminiscing a bit about our formative time here. Um, graduate school was so different from anything I'd ever done and so challenging that um, I'm not sure I fully appreciated all of the positive aspects of my experience at the time. I was always worrying about the next deadline um, whether my work was good enough, concerns uh, that are so common to so many grad students and that, sadly, I have to say, don't really disappear upon the completion of the PhD. <laughs> my approach at the time was kind of like that of a hurdle jumper. I was always looking at the next hurdle and trying to make it over successfully. We all know how challenging grad school is. Acting as a counterbalance to all of that were the many positive aspects of HD. I probably took these for granted at the time because I didn't have any idea of what grad school was supposed to be like or how advisors were supposed to act, I really had no reference point. Um, to put my comments in context, I'm a medical anthropologist. I became a medical anthropologist here in HD with the help of faculty and fellow students who shared my enthusiasm for learning about the messy details of human experience through ethnography. My main takeaway, I would say, about my experience of getting the PhD in HD, if I had to sum it up all in one word, um, the positive aspects of it would be collaboration. Only in discussion with other grad students in other programs did I learn that this collaboration was actually uncommon. The spirit of collaboration was not a given in grad school, nor was it natural. Instead, it was something that was actively and purposefully cultivated by the faculty members in the department. It had to be purposely cultivated, especially among the anthropologists and the anthropologists in training in HD, because as many of you know, ethnography is really often thought of as like a lone wolf practice or a lone wolf activity where you're going out on your own, you're doing the field work on your own, you're analyzing the data on your own, you're writing it up on your own, um, you're the one who really only knows about your own data. Um, sorry, my notes are all over the place. Um, but in fact, what I found from going through HD was that academic life is so much richer and more productive and supportive um, with collaborative peers and mentors. And I now model that for my students and my own teaching. Um, a few specific memories that illustrate the spirit that I'm talking about. These are things I think about a lot now that I'm, now that I'm in a position to be a faculty member and a mentor and a teacher. These memories provide me with models for how to build a supportive community in my own department. So the first one I want to talk about is um, Tanya Lerman's work, um, cultivating a community of scholars interested in pulling apart and understanding the messy details of mental illness and cultural context. It was probably her class clinical ethnography, which I took as a master, master of Arts student, MAP student, in 2001, that made me realize the explanatory power and excitement of ethnographic research and actually made me want to go on and do a PhD. She took it upon herself to establish ethnographic research opportunities in mental health city settings across Chicago for every student in that class, which I now realize was a massive undertaking. Um, then Tanya included a number of us HD grad students in her multi-year research project on mental illness and homelessness among women living in Uptown. That was an amazing training opportunity also, to learn how to be an ethnographer alongside your peers and to share field notes and weekly meetings about our work and our findings. It was unique for sure. The experience made me realize the potential for collaborative ethnography, something that's exceedingly rare in anthropology today. I've since developed an undergraduate course based on the methods of team ethnography that I learned in that um, project with Tanya, and it turns out it's a great way to study certain topics, and students also love it. Um, okay. Um, the second memory I want to share is uh, memories of Jennifer Cole's uh, teaching and classes and seminars with Jennifer. 
Um, especially the ethnographic writing class that I know she teaches like on a yearly basis or something like that, um, which I've taken multiple times. Um, that writing class was a great example of people actually, students actually working together to make each other's writing better. And it was a model that I had never experienced before. Um, and it was so successful that I think we spun it off into multiple different writing groups after the seminars were over. Um, I think I've been in four or five different writing groups with people in HD. I'm currently in one now with two HD graduates. Um, and so I think that's quite a legacy for you, Jennifer, because we're still doing the model that you set up for us. Um, so thanks for that. Um, the last thing I want to specifically share today um, of the kind of actively cultivated collaborative spirit that I'm referring to with HD is the clinical ethnography workshop, especially during its incarnation as a biweekly evening event hosted uh, at Burt Kohler's house. I remember how special it felt to be sitting among a huge group of like-minded students and faculty discussing someone's project in depth, asking questions and offering ideas. The space in which we met contributed to the feeling of collaboration. How can you not feel a sense of communitas while sitting shoulder to shoulder with your peers, sunk deep in a, in a warm, comfortable couch, eating pizza and passing around all kinds of candy and chocolates? That workshop taught me that research and analysis were not lone wolf activities, but were deeply collaborative efforts improved by sustained, supportive, su sustained and supportive colleagues. The workshop provided me with a model of how to participate as a member of an academic community. Uh, building people up rather than tearing them down. Okay, uh, in the time that's left, um, I was also asked to talk about future directions for research. Um, so there's many directions I could go in with this, but one thing that I want to highlight and think about, um, one of the <coughs> things that I thought was so great about HD during the time that I was there was the ability or the, the kind of intense focus among the anthropologists in the department on really building a special kind of focus in anthropology, psychological, psychiatric, and medical anthropology, really thinking about um, people's experience in social and cultural context. Um, and in medical anthropology and psychological anthropology, there's long been a focus on big problems, um, the effects of violence and social suffering, social inequalities, and serious mental illness. Uh, which are all super important and things that I've studied in my own research and, and many other people who have come out of HD have studied these things. But I would argue that it's time for us to expand our focus even further and also look more seriously at the positive and productive aspects of human experience. So I'm talking about explicitly focusing on projects that deal with pleasure, happiness, hope, um, what I like to gloss is like things that work, right? What, what works about human experience today? I feel like there's almost a bias in anthropology against these topics, uh, maybe because they're not seen as being serious enough. Um, and we're very, very good in anthropology at kind of looking for failures and identifying failures. But I think we need to also start thinking about what works for people, what makes people happy. Um, and so I'll end on that. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Rick, for inviting me to participate in this panel. And thank you, Margaret, and the rest of the organizers. I'm honored to be a part of this panel. Uh, and I can't resist being in, in this room testing something. I want to I see how many looks of recognition I get when I say this. Queep. Queep. <laughs> All right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, and those are just nonsense syllables, just find someone who looks like they've taken cultural psychology from Rick in the last, I would say 10 years, but it's probably longer than that. Uh, at least 20, <laughs> and ask, uh, said many times in this room. Um, so just a few months after I arrived at uh, Comparative Human Development, I developed a twitch, uh, like a flutter. No, nothing serious, you look all afraid. There's a very minor flutter in my eyelid, my left eye. It was a little annoying. I noticed this when I was in a language methods course uh, taught by a visiting uh, lecturer, Stephanie Purcell, I think John was his name. And there were only three people on the course, so I was terrified that everyone could notice that my eye was twitching uncontrollably. And so I went uh, to the student care center, not for that, but for something else, some other virus that was ripping through campus or whatever. And I, and I mentioned this to them, and they were very patient and indulgent. I could tell from their face they'd seen it a thousand times before. They said, oh, you're having a stress reaction. You're, just, you're stressed and it's coming out. And I thought, okay, that, that's, that's fine. But I didn't fully understand uh, why, why was this happening? Because I'd been stressed before, but I'd never had a twitch like this was happening. What was going on? And I, and I was very happy to be here. I thought I was less stressed. And I didn't understand it 
until a few months later, I was introduced to the introductory lectures in psychoanalysis uh, by Sigmund Freud, I think probably in Giant Theories of the Self, uh, and then later uh, as an intern in Self, Culture, and Society, and came across the theory of the conservation of psychic energy, uh, or what's sometimes referred to in the Peter Gay translation as the hydraulic theory of psychic energy. And so the etiology of my twitch is, is, goes like this. It actually begins before I came to HD, and that's one thing that I'll say is that uh, Someone's attitude about graduate school, I think, I'm gonna make a claim here. We can't say anthropologists never make claims. I'm gonna make a very strong claim here. Uh, someone's attitude about graduate school will tell you just as much about where they come from uh, as, as how they feel about the program. And so for me, I was coming from working in a big box retail setting at a Menards, which is kind of in the model of a Home Depot. Menards is not the worst kind of human exploitation. There are, there are worse. <laughs> You're making more than minimum wage, you have a roof over your head, you have some modicum of authority or maybe an illusion of authority. Uh, and yet, <laughs> there are aspects of it that are just positively soul crushing. If you're a fan of the book 1984 and you want to see where that <coughs> prophecy happened, go work in a Menards or something like it for about a year. There's remote surveillance, it's, it's just really strange stuff. So anyway, I went from that uh, milieu to comparative human development where I was compelled to read texts that I found just immensely fascinating. I was surrounded by brilliant people. I was in this room. The first four weeks of uh, cultural psychology were probably some of the most intellectually transformative experiences of my life. I've <coughs> talked to students who've taken that course and who wouldn't otherwise use the term mind-blowing, but they use it to refer to what happens in the first several weeks of that course, especially. Uh, every conversation with John Lucy was just, you saw the world in a different way after talking to him for 15 minutes. And so, so getting back to the, uh, the twitch then, why the twitch? Well, I realized that I was so happy where I was, I felt I couldn't complain. I couldn't complain about anything. 400 pages of reading, I can't complain about that. <laughs> Three papers due at the same time, I can't complain about that. Right. Uh, and, and so I realized I just had no outlet right, for, for the inevitable stresses that come from being in a place like this, which is also demanding. And so the negative uh, confirmation of this theory was I started complaining, liberally, <laughs> frequently, to anyone who would listen. Can you believe we have 400 pages of reading this week? Can you believe these papers are due at the same time? How am I supposed to write about standard language in a thousand words, John, for God's sake? <laughs> uh, and you can ask my friends in my cohort at the time, they can verify that I complained quite a bit. And the symptom disappeared, the twitch disappeared. <laughs> so there are at least three themes I'd like to draw out of the etiology of this, of this um, symptom. First, I would just suggest to you to complain a lot. <laughs> Liberally, frequently, to anyone who will listen, preferably to someone who can empathize and knows what you're complaining about and why you're complaining. Um, the second, and I think I can state this as a general rule, is that comparative human development, and, and not all of graduate school, but comparative human development, will not cause you any psychosomatic affliction for which it will not also provide you with the tools to understand, <laughs> if not cure that psychosomatic affliction, right? which is some measure of comfort. Uh, and then finally, third and the most important point is to revisit uh, just why it was so, so blissful here for me and why it was such an improvement uh, over the, the, the situation I was coming from. Um, I mentioned Rick, I mentioned John, uh, later, uh, Jennifer Cole's ethnographic writing course taught me what a dissertation chapter looked like, and I had no idea. Uh, Tanya's, Tanya was only here for the first quarter that I was here, but it was such a memorable uh, quarter, the HD Concepts course, when we read uh, uh, Witchcraft Oracles and Magic and Never in Anger and Saint Scholars and Schizophrenics. Um, but then also just the, the interdisciplinarity and my understanding of it, people ask me, what is, what is the purpose, what is the point of interdisciplinarity uh, in comparative human development? Uh, and the, the, the cross-pollination, I think, does happen. I'm always interested in hearing about how it happens, but I've always thought about it as a space for people to do the kind of work themselves that doesn't fit neatly into one disciplinary boundary. Um, and that's something I was able to do, something I came to graduate school without what is now recommended, which is a clear idea of what you ought to be doing. You know, what you're going to do, you apply with an idea. I didn't have that wisdom to follow, so I came here with no idea of, of what it was that I wanted to study, uh, and comparative human development is just 
the ideal place to have no idea what you want to study. <laughs> um, and I, Rick asked us to say a little bit about our future directions in research. I'm almost out of time, so I'll just say very quickly. Uh, my dissertation was uh, on the conflict over Native American whale hunting in the Northwest. And one thing I found, one thing that you might surprise you, is that for the U.S. federal government, uh, whales, gray whales, all kinds of whales, are essentially still fish uh, to the U.S. federal government in the way that they're managed. Um, they, I've, uh, scientists refer to it as actuary science. Uh, it's, they're, they're, they're elements of statistical models. If you go to the federal government and you say, you can't kill whales, you're an activist, you say, I'm, I'm against whale hunting. Uh, given the status of whales in the popular imaginary, you'd think that, that you'd be able to make that claim. In fact, all you can really argue for is a quota of zero, um, which I think is fascinating. My dissertation tracked the, con the consequences for how uh, entrenched bureaucratic <laughs> systems of wildlife management can have moral consequences in debates about things like whales. And my future research, I hope to track down and actually go talk to the scientists and figure out why is it uh, that whales are still treated like large fish. So, sorry, a little bit of a non sequitur at the end, but that's where I'm going with uh, my research in the future. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Kaufman, and I am currently across campus as a postdoc at a uh, NIA uh, institutional research site, the Center on Aging. And um, I came here many moons ago. I actually feel like I got through relatively quickly compared to some of the companions <laughs> I have on the panel, which Social comparison, we know, is very important. Um, I undertook a very long uh, term, actually almost 50 year longitudinal study of lives that began at Harvard in 1960 for my dissertation. I did a follow up during the course of my graduate studies here. And um, I would be very happy to spend some time, if you're interested later, in talking about that. But um, I feel, I, w I think I would feel remiss in not following Rick's instructions if I didn't take my comments in a slightly different direction. Rick, I believe you instructed, at least this is the email that I received, panelists to roast, boast, and toast HD here on th this occasion. And I have heard plenty of toasting, and I've heard plenty of boasting, <laughs> but I have not heard sufficient roasting. So. Given my lengthy experience as a graduate student, as a PhD student, I now give you the top 10 reasons to get your PhD in human development. <laughs> Reason number 10, so you can be upstaged in your very first graduate class by a 16-year-old MD PhD student in the class, one of Burke Kohler's protégés who has read the entire syllabus of, of obscure Freud readings before the class begins and has a faculty member's mastery of it. I see a confirmatory nod. <laughs> Reason number nine to get your PhD in human development. So you can be in, the, in a place where social gerontology was founded as a discipline and study aging. Most notably your own. <laughs> Reason number eight. So that if your relationship with your own mother is or was rocky or unsatisfying, you can get a new mother. Bernice Newgarden, <laughs> who according to Bert Kohler was and is the mother of us all. <laughs> Reason number seven to get your PhD in human development. Well, P being a PhD in human development invites you, as we all know, to study attachment. There are many opportunities of doctoral students to their mentors, to their PhD theses, and to Hyde Park and the strange situation that is introduced when one must leave. <laughs> Reason number six, one also becomes a PhD in human development to witness the alarming and terrifying brilliant, brilliance of Rick Schwader, John Lucy, and other faculty at a workshop or at a job talk pose a single question at the end of the talk that unravels the entire argument so carefully crafted in a job candidate's prior five years. <laughs> Reason number five, to have the privilege of receiving such a terrifying question oneself at a workshop before going out to another institution to give one's job talk, thereby, thereby averting disaster. <laughs> Reason number four to get a PhD in human development, to witness the flashes of pithy brilliance from every corner, such as, and Tanya, I, I see you in the back, I hope I'm getting this correctly, your observation delineating human development from other departments and disciplines at the university. If I remember it correctly, it is, 
Psychology has the neuron, anthropology has the state, and human development has the person. Is that correct? Sure. <laughs> Reason number three, one becomes a PhD student in human development so that one can study, quote unquote, lives in context. So that by the end of a lengthy preparation, one even knows what that turn of phrase means. And if asked, can provide a lengthy commentary. Reason number two, one becomes a PhD student in human development to engage in the eternal quest to know what exactly human development is, both the department and the subject. I see John Lucy nodding, lending great authority to that observation. And the top reason to get your PhD in human development, uh, no, excuse me, please wait a moment. Reason number 1.4, one becomes a PhD student in human development to discover that counting to 10 or from 10 correctly is better left to quantitatively oriented scholars. And a top 10 list can go on actually much longer. <laughs> Reason number 1.3, one becomes a PhD student in human development to form friendships for a lifetime and to link one's identity to a delicate experiment of shared inquiry in social science scholarship and education that continues after 75 years to survive and thrive. Reason number 1.2, one comes to get a PhD in human development so that one can hopefully get a PhD from human development. <laughs> Reason number 1.1, one gets a PhD in human development to enter a veritable candy shop, that is a common usage here, of ideas and opportunities to study social phenomena and to get to study one's favorite flavor intensively over years. Reason number 1.0, or the number one reason one comes to get a PhD from human development is so that one can look, uh, so that one can come back for its 75th reunion and marvel at the fact that PhD graduates and I assume many non-PhD graduates attending from other generations largely share something of the same early adult experience as one's own, ma making the department with its enduring ideals and commitments the parents of us all. That's my roasting. I do want to, at the risk of uh, disconcerting you um, with a very different orientation here, it's, I, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't take a minute to reflect on Bert Kohler. A, a man beloved to me, and I know to many of us, and central to our community. And um, I'm going to try to hit my time limit, uh, but please forgive me. Um, so Larry and Susan, I, I actually, I don't know where you're sitting, but I, I remember your comment written on the In Memoriam website for, uh, some four years ago after Bert died. And you wrote, which I think is captured very well, some special people like Bert are ageless in our minds. They have become veritable icons of the institutions to which they committed the purpose, vitality, and talents of their lifetimes. And I think that's, um, that, that captures Bert well. Um, Bert's institutional longevity and knowledge linked the department with its past. Bert was a keeper of community knowledge and values. He influenced doctoral training and the research agenda in the department and he was highly committed to teaching all over the university, not, in ju not just in the department. Um, Bert is a veritable icon of our community and everyone, or many people have commented he would feel um, that this would, be, this would be a high point for him to be at this celebration and remembrance of human development. And I think at the same time, uh, his centrality to our community and what human development means is really um, at least behooves me to remember him. And I, I, I remember a comment or a, a, an observation George Valiant made about guardians um, which is a refinement of Erickson's model um, on, a, on the final stage of human development. And he said that guardians are caretakers. They take responsibility for the cultural values and riches from which we all benefit, offering their concern beyond specific individuals to their culture. I would argue that Bert was indeed such a guardian of our community, but he did it not only in the public ways that we all know as, as a repository of institutional knowledge and values, but he did it through the care of individuals on a massive scale by the hundreds and thousands. And I love Bert and I miss, miss him dearly. And I, I'm sure that many of you feel the exact same sentiment. And I couldn't have uh, made comments here without remembering Bert. So thank you.
much to our panel. That was really wonderful. And I wondered if, um, you know, this is a, an amazing uh, group of our, you know, graduates of this uh, program, but I wondered if we could also just invite all um, individuals in the audience who have earned a graduate degree, whether master's or PhD from this department, if you could just stand so that we can sort of recognize your contribution to the community wow. as well. Right. Now, um, we only have about 10 minutes, uh, but we have the entire evening ahead of us to continue conversations. But um, why don't we just take a couple, uh, if anyone has any questions for our, our panel. <coughs> None of our current PhD students want to take advantage of this <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> I can say that I decidedly remember debating Rick during my job interview, and I believe it was John who also told me I needed to do a better job debating Rick. I feel like <laughs> someone gave me that clue to like just get in there and just go head to head with Rick. <laughs> All right. Can we add something? Yes, of course, please. Can we add to this top ten? I tell people that one of the reasons to go to the University of Chicago be, is that you can talk at a cocktail party for 10 minutes on any topic. <laughs> Maybe we've hit this afternoon lull. <laughs> We're going to a top, I guess, 20 list then? <laughs> um, I guess I would tell people the University of Chicago is a place of choice because there is so much talent here. As I said in my comments, if you have a reasonable idea, there are people here within the department and within the university who will support you. And it, it's a really rare kind of situation as far as I'm concerned. I also want to say one more thing about Dan Friedman. We heard a lot about him this this. Uh, this afternoon, and I guess maybe we haven't remembered him properly, but he passed away in 2008, and I don't know if some of you know, we did a festra for him in 1995. Carol and Glenn Weisfeld and I organized this here, and it was a wonderful, wonderful event, attended by about 100 people. It was supported by the APA uh, Science Directorate, and we published a book that came out called Uniting Psychology and Biology. Uh, integrative Perspectives on Human Development, and I think it was something that, that we were very proud of, and of course Dan was as well. So I actually would like to say something really practical. <laughs> so I've been thinking about why it is that this feels like an intellectual home to me, and earlier Bob Levine or Levine was saying how early on somebody was doing a study of bilingualism and how rare that was. And I think I realize now in this very moment that this feels like an intellectual home because I think it's like being an intellectual multilingual to be at HD in the sense that you're always synthesizing and using a variety of different perspectives. And so, that's really wonderful because it allows you to sort of have hybridity and syntheses and multiple perspectives. But there is another side to it, just sort of echoing Joan Miller a little bit, which is that out there, <coughs> sometimes people are, are monolingual. In fact, not infrequently they're monolingual. And so then you sort of have to figure out, I think, how to make that work. And um, I think I thought quite a bit about this when I finished up my PhD and I tried to get into the field of psychology and realized that A, the topic I'd studied, which involved religion, was pretty much absent. The sort of cultural and developmental perspective I'd taken was sort of rather unusual. And so from a really practical perspective, I've been thinking about well, what does that mean? How, how can one make that work? And, uh, I think one aspect of it is just persistence. I mean, I think that really just continuing to do the work and believing in it really does help, and that time will ultimately be in your favor. 
Um, but I also think that it really helps to have networks. And I've sometimes wondered if, it, for example, coming out of this kind of event, we could build more networks. Because I think it really matters who, for example, is in those editorial positions, or who is heading a certain kind of conference, or um, who leads a certain kind of workshop. And if there's a way, now that I look out at all of those persons, all of you who just stood up, I realized that if I had known more of that network and maybe going forward, if we all knew more of that network, that that actually would be a way to support um, going forward. Um, I think another aspect, just very practically, I am kind of optimistic in the sense that I've noticed over the years when I've taught cultural psychology, it used to be a big revelation to my students. And now it's more of a big revelation to me often what they have to say, because they're already so cultural. They're very international in many ways. And so uh, time is kind of in favor, I think, of, of the kind of approach here. And I guess just for me, the last part that I've found useful in sort of being this in-between or both or something is just to try maybe to be more entrepreneurial. If the field will not sort of take you in, well, maybe you can just sort of try to do something that you would like in the field. Um, and so in recent years, uh, for example, um, editing books is one way that you could sort of try to create your own kind of parameters and then try to bring people together that way. So uh, kind of picking a little bit up on that earlier conversation that I think Joan Miller in part initiated and there's a Basha in the room who sort of asked as well. Um, I went to lunch thinking about that. So those are some, some thoughts on that. I, th I think we have a, oh great, thanks Resni. We have a question right here. We can get the microphone. I have a different um, experience. I had two degrees before I entered um, human development, and then I got a doctorate afterwards. But to me, HD was very enabling. It was not practical, but enabling, because it opened up a whole new world, maybe because I married a wonderful man, too. That helped. But. Um, I, I see HD as, the, as a Venn diagram in which you have math, statistics, computer science, uh, intersecting with theory and, and, and the, the, the sociology, economics, um, psychology, etc. Um, and then in, intersecting with a domain that we're interested in. Um, actually, in the end, I, I, it enabled me to become a full professor and department chair at the School of Medicine in Washington University, St. Louis. And thank you very much, A.D. I think we have time for either one final comment or one final question. Or we can just break early and, we have, uh, and chat, which we're probably, oh good, okay, excuse me. Not a question, um, actually. Um, I'm kind of a funny person to be here all yesterday and today because I'm technically a PhD in educational psychology um, from that department that doesn't exist anymore in Jodhpur. Um, but I think that um, I am here because this was in many ways, HD was my home, even though my degree was in educational psychology. And I think that says a lot about HD. Um, I came to University of Chicago in fall of 78, and those of you who follow the history of the world, uh, I'm from Iran, and that's when the revolution in Iran happened, and I never have been back since, because I'm a Baha'i, and Baha'is are persecuted there. And the University of Chicago faculty, this is a campus, as you know, it's not known for its friendliness. But that wasn't true of my experience. Um, I was so cared for, um, I had lost pretty much everything in a, within the first year or two of being here. And they just totally wrapped me. And I think the people are here, many of them, some have passed away, some that you have mentioned. Um, Alison Clark Sewer was probably my academic mother and Jack Getzels was my academic father. Uh, but just like all of you who have had extended families, uh, it's wonderful to spend time at aunts and uncles and grandparents' home, and that was HD for me. Um, I couldn't get the psych faculty to understand importance of culture, 
And I kept saying, but what you're talking about is not what I experienced when I grew up. So there's got to be some other way of looking at this. And then I could walk over to HD and I could spend hours in Rick's office um, and uh, Mike Chiksamahai's office and, and um, explore all the ideas that I needed to explore to pull my thoughts together. And I think that, uh, and then later on, Jim Stigler came, um, who uh, I'm very grateful for the time that we spent together here. He agreed to be on my committee along with Susan Golden Meadow. Um, and what I wanted to wrap my comments with, I can probably go on for hours because <laughs> I stayed in Hyde Park. I'm only a few blocks away from here. Um, and I had continued to have a double life. I'm at Northeast Illinois University as a career, but I continue to be engaged with University of Chicago, thanks to Rick and Susan and many who continue to welcome me back to campus. Um, but I think that, yes, it's an amazing intellectual place, and I, I'm forever grateful to have had this gift. But I actually learned many things. Uh, from Allison, I not only learned how to do research and how to understand theory, but I also learned how to be a woman. I learned how to be a mother, how to cook. Um, <laughs> my first class at University of Chicago was at Hare Apartment, the only tall building then uh, here near campus. And, um, and I was so lucky that at the time that I came to University of Chicago, there were young faculty who then, we had our children together. So I had an extended family uh, for my children, all of whom were University of Chicago faculty and graduate students. So among <coughs> them is John Lucy and Suzanne Gaskins, Susan Golden Meadow, Martha McClintock, who's not here, but I've been texting her during these last two days, just telling her how much we miss her being here. And uh, Herman Sanaiko and Susie Fisher, we all raised our children together. And they, we were each other's children's um, sort of uncles and aunts. And, and uh, so I think that it's an interesting thing. It's a wonderful intellectual community, but to me, it gave me a lot more than all the theories and research methodology for which I'm thankful. What are and I also want to say that I continue to send my students to University of Chicago. We have two here from uh, our department, Amanda uh, Brown, who is one of the organizers here, and uh, Resnik Akwar, who is a really a wonderful student of mine and who is now a student here. And we also hire your students. So the person who, the person who uh, finished with the dissertation award that you all heard about yesterday, Dave Kern, is our newest faculty in our department, and Suzanne Gaskins, um, and uh, several others, Brecky Church, uh, Linda Ruckert. Uh, so it's a very interesting north and south relationship yes. that we have built. Well, thank you for that. Margaret, yes? And then we're going to have to break okay. so that we don't <coughs> run late. I just, want, I just need to share another perspective about uh, the department and being a student here and training. And that is, um, you know, we were well trained to, um, you know, understand the cultural context, but most often it was about cultures in other places. <coughs> so I'm eternally grateful for the fact that, you know, I arrived here this was, uh, and I had two degrees, and the first was in pharmacy, <laughs> and the second I arrived here with two babies, and uh, had just earned a, a degree in psychology from KU. And I came here uh, because I, I mean, I did not see my beautiful children in text, except after, except under, you know, just uh, columns, of, uh, me, pardon me, uh, entries having to do with the deviance, the, the pathology, et cetera. And I'm ever grateful for, in essence, a perspective about culture in this country uh, that was shared, that was inclusive of people of color, uh, that were not pathological perspectives. So I want to acknowledge, Edgar, like uh, Saba, I, my, um, I was in human development, but I had Edgar Epps as my chair, and Diana Slaughter as my child person, Sue Stodolsky as my methodologist. And I will be ever appreciative of the fact that, you know, the three of them, you know, were always, you know, just very supportive in helping me to clarify my thinking about children of color and cultural context 
i.e. the context of the U.S. of uh, America in terms of just the history of how people of color are viewed here and the evolved cultural context. So I am especially appreciative of that because I realized in the subsequent 40 years or so, no counting guys, but just <laughs> approximately, <laughs> uh, that you know, we still have a lot of work to do. So my hope is that you know, comparative human development as we move into the 21st century you know, is, um, you know, addresses uh, the cultural diversity that is also part of our country you know, given the backdrop of unacknowledged themes and issues. So I would hope that for us as we move forward in the 21st century with progressively a greater uh, cultural, in uh, essence, complexity and make, to make sure that we have the skills, perspectives, and the theoretical framing to understand the diversity of development uh, in this country as well. So thanks. Thank you for that.